Um, we'll move to um, Aros Oskun when he's up for it. Would you like to sit down or stand here, maybe? Um, he's a media artist and a scholar living in New York, New School, working at the New School. And um, he will talk about the politics of, uh, or I would, should say, the political economy of cultural production, really. Should I give yeah, you uh, so the floor? And I'll move, remove my name. So. <laughs> Uh, well, I will talk, I'll, uh, make some general remarks rather than uh, concentrating on the YouTube, and uh, I guess my, uh, my remarks will be very much parallel to the story uh, Kylie was telling about, and uh, I think I share in the, uh, the, the, the general framework that uh, she was t uh, talking about. Uh, I'll start with an experience, a, a story, uh, another story that uh, I had recently uh, during the last year. Uh, I'm a media pr uh, practitioner producer uh, as well as uh, my academic uh, studies about media. I do video and digital media works alongside my uh, scholarly work. And uh, my interest in uh, practical media production together with my political formation was developed under the influence of what I would call avant-garde technological vision of 90s. Uh, probably uh, this makes sense to you if, uh, if you are familiar with, uh, with the early uh, developments uh, or early, uh, how, would you, how would I call it, like early perspectives of digital media when it became introduced to our uh, everyday life during the 90s. This vision uh, that we shared at that time quickly recognized certain practical and political potentials uh, introduced by the rise of digital media technologies at that time. For filmmakers like me, one of these uh, practical and political potentials promised uh, by media, digital media technologies, besides making certain production tools available and accessible, was the new ways to reach our public. Uh, like internet, like uh, other interactive media uh, formats, uh, which appeared in those time. And we found this potential revolutionary because it gave us, it gave, it gave us a chance to surpass uh, most of the capitalist mechanisms that paved the way from the production room to the public. So just like a lot of people who embraced this opportunity, uh, me and my friends uh, put up most of our artistic and experimental work online and uh, continue to do so until now. And at the same time, we also quickly recognize the collective and participatory nature of this newfound public. We've worked for creating collective platforms for claiming and expanding this public. Uh, and uh, we even attributed uh, some sort of uh, primacy to these activities to, uh, for building up these collective platforms. And, uh, well, we were uh, doing this in Turkey at that time, but uh, there was, uh, it was a global trend, I, I can say. Uh, we knew that other people were doing similar things in, uh, in Europe, and I guess, for example, Network in, uh, Institute for Network Cultures uh, is an organic uh, product of this kind of efforts. Uh, anyways, uh, one of these videos I produced and presented in this kind of a collective platform uh, was a lengthy interview I made with a friend and colleague of mine, Ulus Baker, who sadly passed away last year. Uh, he, was a quite, he was quite an influential scholar, influential scholar for a younger generation of intellectuals in Turkey, and uh, he left a, quite a scattered body of work behind. And uh, not surpri surprisingly, his passing away generated uh, some sort of interest uh, in his work. Uh, including uh, this, in this interview I made and uh, uh, presented online. Uh, a few months after his passing away, a friend of mine informed me that uh, somebody she knows uh, put this video on YouTube. Uh, what happened is that uh, this person downloaded the video from our site and put it back on YouTube uh, without informing us and without giving any reference to the original context and without providing the information that we also provide with this video on our website. 
So I got quite upset uh, and, uh, well, this, uh, why I got upset, I guess uh, I'll try to uh, explain uh, in the course of this presentation. So I, uh, I got into touch uh, with this person, I emailed him, and uh, I, I harshly expressed my resentment and I said uh, I expected him to, uh, to remove the video from YouTube and otherwise I would uh, complain to YouTube admins for uh, copyright infringement. Uh, she wrote, uh, he wrote back and uh, he was apologetic and he wanted to uh, make his intentions clear he said uh, he appreciated the video and uh, he wanted to share it with the other people and uh, YouTube was a means for such sharing. Uh, he thought the video would be more public, more visible uh, to other people on YouTube and uh, it, had better, it would have better video quality on YouTube. So I wrote back and forth uh, a few times with him and uh, uh, well, uh, I explained to him that uh, YouTube never offered, offered a better video quality because he was re uh, recompressing the video and uh, technically that wouldn't be possible. And uh, the original video already had, uh, you know, it was, search, uh, it was registered to, through search engines, etc. So uh, more public visibility was not a relevant idea as well. So, uh, but uh, for me this was... Uh, this signified some sort of a confrontation, which uh, I would like to build upon. And uh, of course, uh, during my, uh, uh, during my uh, correspondence with him, I never told him that uh, my threat was a bluff, because I never uh, had copyrights on this, uh, on this video. I never uh, put a copyright sign. There was no express copyrights, because we left this work to the public, for public use, uh, uh, when, we, when we produced it. Uh, now, uh, there are, is, uh, ironically, uh, the motives of this person was also some sort of a uh, publicity, some sort of uh, collective uh, grounds. Like, uh, as I said, uh, he appreciated it and he wanted to share it. So, what I see here is a confrontation between two ideas of public, two forms of public. Uh, on one hand, uh, the, our the, the, our, uh, the public that is uh, perhaps uh, represented by our collective actions, on the other hand, the public represented by uh, YouTube. Uh, and his intentions are clear in this way. He publicizes it, he makes it public. So th these two confronting ideas of public can, uh, has to be analyzed, I think, has to be interrogated in a way. Back in the 90s, uh, the immediate effects of digital media technologies were identified uh, as leading to an ontological transformation. And this uh, ontological transformation uh, sort of enveloped the political discourses, theoretical discourses uh, around it. Electronic and, di di do you hear me if I, if I stand up like this? Uh, electronic and digital media was radically transforming the way we relate to outside world, the modes of representation, and consequently, the temporal and speci special categories of everyday exp experience. And uh, such recognition resulted in mi mixed reactions and different political concerns. One, on one hand, scholars like Paul Virilio, Jean Baudry are being, con being concerned with the challenge that uh, this, this new re regime uh, brings to, uh, to the uh, circulation of knowledge, information, and images, uh, found this ontological transformation threatening at the very least. Hyperreality and simulacrum became key, key concepts referring to uh, a political problem which appeared as a, as a consequence of such epistemological crisis. The loss of the sense and the knowledge of reality, a schizophrenic communication environment in which sem semantic relations lost their references, and as a consequence, implosion of public sphere under the domination of new and arbitrary power relations. Uh, on the other hand, the same transformation was hailed with an affirmation by the avant-garde technological vision I mentioned above. Uh, it inspired especially the people who became early practitioners of uh, practitioners and pioneers of these technologies. For them, there was a revolutionary potential in the immaterialization, virtualization, 
brought by these digital uh, technologies. Perhaps uh, something best exemplified in, the, uh, in Pierre Levy's utopic liberal interpretation of being virtual. Uh, for, for this vision, the practical effects of ontological transformation would inevitably have consequences, nothing less radical than the steam engine which brought uh, the industrial revolution. And digital media was perceived as such a leap uh, which would ult ultimately bring the post-industrial revolution. And just as the industrial revolution gave us capitalism as an economic and political form, uh, for this vision, it was more than imaginable that post-industrial revolution would lead to a post-capitalist political and economic form. In this regard, uh, this avant-garde vision embodied some sort of naturalism. The immediate of, uh, effects of digital media technologies, uh, virtualization and materialization were confined to a field which we can uh, say uh, the, pr the field of cultural production, but uh, but this uh, informational cognitive linguistic uh, products and activities which became uh, virtualized, immaterialized, would eventually uh, change, uh, uh, eventually transform the everyday life because these, these were the fields where everyday relations were reproduced. Uh, there was a, uh, this, this is the uh, reproductive uh, sphere of, uh, of the social. What we thought was that, uh, I mean, information wants to be free was the uh, slogan of those days. And once information would be free, everything would follow that. Uh, people would gain basic when they uh, gain basic skills of uh, you know emailing, web surfing, etc. They would uh, find other resources of information. They would articulate this information, uh, this knowledge to their everyday practices, develop themselves, become resourceful in adding to these uh, these sorts of informations. Uh, back again. So uh, collective intelligence, a term coined by Marx long ago, would at last find its more con concrete form in digital networks as such and uh, promise us an immutable soci sociopolitical change. Uh, the spirit of the 90s perhaps finds its best expression in the radicality of hacker and cyborg uh, myths. What, what uh, was accepted or anticipated as naturally was in fact a new human nature. Uh, and even in the less radical imaginary, the free flow of information in decentralized global communication networks promised nothing but a more democratic governance to the degree that democracy has been associated with informed citizenship participating to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the governments. Now, both of these skeptical and aff affirmative political uh, visions, which stemmed from uh, let's say, left-wing progressive political perspectives, interestingly broke apart, apart and undermined a very key theoretical framework, which had been uh, the pillar of modern, modern pro progressive politi politics at that, until that time. Which, this is uh, the critical political economy formulated in the early Marxist political theory. Uh, according to this uh, criticism, uh, the class domination was uh, stemmed from the economic production itself and the uh, uh, political transformation referred back to the transformation of economic relations. And uh, in a way, the break between the 90s avant-garde political vision and the preceding uh, socialist progressive politics is somehow in the understandable because this uh, theoretical uh, framework, political criticism, took into account, account uh, industrial uh, production industrial capitalist uh, production and uh, it defined its theoretical tools like labor uh, and value within that uh, industrial mode of production, which was surpass, uh, surpassed uh, with the post-industrialization, of course. So th it didn't give much, uh, much tools to think with uh, to, the, uh, to this uh, new progressive uh, imaginary. And, uh, well, I'm not gonna go into the details of how this uh, formulation uh, was conceived, but uh, it also refused, in a way, in its crude form, uh, the ideological, uh, the power of ideological uh, processes against uh, the power of economic determination. Uh, this was a, a very much a questioned issue, but uh, 
like the base, uh, I'm talking about the base superstructure uh, dualism, which defined this uh, political economy, uh, economic criticism. Uh, this was questioned by the 60s, by the late 60s, by many uh, offsprings of Marxism, which we call post-structuralism uh, today. Uh, Foucault's criticism on one hand, Althusser's on the other, and uh, cultural studies uh, school of Birmingham school on, uh, on, on another uh, uh, side. And all this uh, gave some partial perspectives to the 90s uh, uh, vision. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so uh, even though this uh, base and superstructure dualism was uh, sort of questioned, uh, the theoretical frameworks uh, for, for a certain degree uh, structured the everyday political institutions, the uh, institutionalized politics. So there, uh, there was this break. Uh, the, uh, the new media sphere was uh, defined as a new political uh, realm which didn't get much uh, tools to, to work with from this, uh, from this uh, cri uh, critical perspective. Now, uh, a, a decade later, at this point, uh, I guess it will be relevant to, uh, to reconsider this relation. Because the, the, uh, the radical changes anticipated in the 90s is not yet here. And uh, what we see, uh, in the way uh, Kylie also uh, uh, tried to describe, is that uh, we, uh, we, we, we see an opposite tendency uh, of what we were expecting in the 90s, in a way. The driving engine that shapes the current landscape, uh, landscape is no more the uh, avant-garde vision of 90s, but uh, certain uh, managerial discourses gathered under the term uh, Web 2.0. Uh, these discourses carry and refer to certain notions which have been essential to the online communications from the very beginning. Dynamic participation, interactivity, decentralization, non-hierarchical or non organization, autonomy, self-expression, freedom of expression, etc. But at the same time, uh, it appears uh, as an economic discourse which formulates these notions as highly efficient new techniques for profit-oriented commercial ma media production. And user-generated content is uh, a central uh, one, uh, a key element uh, in these discourses. Now, along the same period uh, when there was this uh, uh, avant-garde vision appearing, there was also a significant body of theoretical work focusing on social effects of digital technologies departing from the uh, similar grounds with early Marxist criticism uh, while radically altering uh, some of the notions, some of the concepts produced in this, uh, in this early uh, Marxist criticism. Uh, this literature ev evaluated the effects of ontological transformation I mentioned above in regards to cap capitalist production. What happens to value, labor, value, and other production relations under these uh, ontological conditions? That was how they, uh, how they framed uh, the main problem. How the capitalist production adapts to and takes the advantage of new information technologies, how new social, social subjectivities are shaped within these production relations. Uh, this literature first defined a tendency in capitalism, which, uh, which appeared actually, according to this uh, recognition, uh, uh, which appeared actually be even before 90s. And uh, this tendency was, from, uh, uh, from, uh, was towards being market-oriented from being uh, production-oriented. And uh, uh, the new informa the development of information technologies were, was very much related with this new orientation because only through these technologies it became more possible, feasible, and efficient for profit-making purposes to respond to and control markets. Uh, and organizing production resources flexibly according to this control. Uh, so uh, what happened was a uh, uh, postmodern Toyota model replacing modern Fordist production uh, principles. They call this post Fordism. And uh, the, the control of market as such uh, 
was, uh, as I said, uh, made uh, possible through various form of inform forms of information technologies, uh, actually meant the control of everyday social sphere in a way. Uh, the important thing at this moment was not efficiently organizing the labor, raw material, and other productive resources around the assembly line of the factory, but to restructure the social relations, desires, habits, and social language in general towards creating and sustaining consumption patterns. Capitalism no more organizes itself around, is confined uh, in the disciplinary spaces of factories, but spread over the surface of everyday life by controlling so, uh, social and uh, turning the social into economically productive. Deleuze described this transformation early in the 80s as a passage from disciplinary, disciplinary society to controlled society. He was looking into how economic transformation restructured social subjectivation and social sphere. Capitalism no more seeked for labor power, but social activities uh, for its production. And it, it, aimed, it, it no more aimed to sell finished products, but uh, lifestyles, brands, continuous uh, regenerative consumption patterns. Well, and this wasn't a abandoning of the disciplinarity of uh, previous uh, for this form. It just uh, spread the disciplinarity uh, it, uh, it, uh, it merged different disciplinary patterns which were, which were confined in different spaces of, uh, of the social uh, onto each other. And uh, immaterial labor became a key defining uh, concept for post fordist economy. It, it was the form of labor which, uh, which, which became operational for the production of uh, immaterial goods, basically. Uh, immaterial goods, products, and services. And uh, the, uh, the definitive uh, element, the, the key thing uh, to immaterial uh, labor, the conception of immaterial labor was that it was dense with linguistic, ideological, and cognitive processes, and uh, it was constituted by such cap capacities. And uh, as a consequence, this form of labor was not uh, easily identifiable as uh, the manual labor, uh, if we, uh, for the sake of uh, speech, the manual labor that, that became operational at the, uh, at the assembly line in the factory. And I guess we, as media producers and media professionals, we experienced such uh, uh, such process uh, almost every day, like uh, it is uh, difficult to, to recognize what is work, what is uh, economically productive for our own purposes and what is social. Uh, you go to a, 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 a cocktail and uh, you network with people, which is a social activity, but which becomes economically productive because th those social activities also uh, bring you uh, work. Uh, and in my view, what we see under uh, in user-generated content as a production model epitomizes this economic regime, and uh, it has to be evaluated in this context. If I go back to the uh, story, this confrontation uh, I told in the beginning, uh, this person who uploads the video uh, actually does not appropriate somebody else's Now, this person does not uh, appropriate somebody else's work for any kind of financial and personal gain. Actually, rather than appropriating it, he publicizes it, uh, publicizes it uh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, properly speaking. It's a publication. But this publication itself takes place in, uh, in and articulates to a private channel, as YouTube is a privately owned, profit-oriented commercial channel. In the process of such publication, he delivers his labor and the product of my labor, in this particular case, uh, to such profit-oriented profit commercial channel for free. If the publication of this video refers to any value, which it must, uh, it must refer, because uh, YouTube uh, makes its profit from uh, this kind of contributions, so there must be a value in it, uh, then this value is generated by the unpaid labor of people like this guy and myself. The more interesting thing, though, 
is that these processes involved are not recognized as labor at all. They don't fit into the economic conception of work, uh, since the productive act activity here is not waged or e economically compensated, but it is voluntary, and it is not structured towards a predefined goal, uh, but it is enti entirely precarious. And uh, the value of product as a result of the activity is uh, highly arbitrary and certainly immeasurable. We cannot define how valuable is, uh, uh, is this uh, video or any other video, uh, apart from uh, popularity perhaps, which is still a uh, very arbitrary uh, major idea. Now, what uh, motivates and sustains this productive activity? Okay, what, uh, what motivates and sustains this productive activity is the social interaction it generates, the pleasure of which becomes the compensation for the labor involved. We can define what we observe as work by any means, but it is perfectly play. Uh, it's play in the perfect sense. And the product of such play generates the value which becomes appropriated and exploited for profit. The very basic social in activity interaction becomes the economically productive in terms of generating value. A similar confrontation, like uh, 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 with this one, uh, actually, uh, I mean, there, there are many similar, uh, this, uh, this has been questioned so much. <laughs> You're free. Can all these microphones make me more articulate? Talk? Yeah. <laughs> uh. Okay, a similar debate was uh, happened. Uh, in another platform, when uh, last last FM, uh, perhaps you are familiar with this. Uh, uh, with this, uh, it was a it was a uh, website which which uh, had a community. People were uh, through a through through a software which they which they install on your on their computers. People would uh, aggregate their musical preferences at this website, share it with other people, uh, etc. So it was like bringing, uh, creating a community around uh, their music preferences. So this, uh, uh, this last FM, this website was sold to CBS, and it was uh, like, a, like YouTube or uh, Facebook, etc. It was sold to CBS for 280 million uh, a few years ago, I guess two years ago. And uh, one of the members of this last FM community with a nickname uh, Rumenige, uh, started a discussion on his blog on the same uh, on the same uh, website uh, as a reaction to this sale, and uh, he 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 interpreted this uh, sale as a betrayal to the community uh, because it was a community being sold and not an economic product. He he wrote uh, he he pointed to the fact that what is being sold was not a software platform at all. He said, uh, he was writing, uh, CBS would never have purchased Last FM if it was not for the music community that has been scrobbling. Scrobbling was uh, to upload uh, the, your musical preferences, the stuff you are listening on your computer to the website. Uh, scrobbling and creating a m public sphere within which they can engage in a system of sharing, learning, disseminating, commenting, and experimenting. Uh, what is economically productive and valuable here in the sale is the social interactions built upon the software platform. He suggests that, uh, Rumenige suggests that the $280 million which CBS, by the way CBS is, a, uh, is owned by Viacom actually, uh, pays for Last, uh, Last FM is actually a gift from the scrubbing community to the Last FM headquarters. But since this community had no idea of such value they produced while scrolling, this is truly an act of uh, appropriation, uh, Rumeniger was uh, saying. 
And uh, all these sorts of uh, appropriations uh, leads to something which I, I, I would like to call Hausmannization of the internet. Uh, Hausmann uh, was this architect, was this urban planner who re, 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 uh, replanned Paris after, uh, after a Paris Commune. Uh, in the way uh, of, uh, or according to a control logic, uh, because what happened in the Paris Commune was uh, uh, the rebels could barricade uh, uh, the organic, organic uh, city texture with narrow streets and side alleys and uh, uh, dead, uh, dead ends, and they, they could resist to, uh, to soldiers for a, uh, for a long uh, period. And Hausmann instead replaced these narrow uh, streets and uh, side alleys and dead ends with uh, avenues, large avenues where the uh, soldiers could uh, penetrate uh, any part in the city. And uh, what happens is somehow analogic to that. Uh, instead of uh, small, uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, platforms, Internet is being Hausmannized. Uh, there are these uh, central avenues like YouTube, like uh, uh, what else, uh, Facebook, etc. Uh, and uh, people's uh, movements are directed to, to these large avenues with the, with the twist that uh, these avenues are owned privately now. Uh, Hausmann's uh, large public avenues were, were still uh, sort of uh, in private, uh, in public uh, of the municipality or whatsoever. Now, uh, and uh, these, uh, the, the economic activity is uh, very clear. This, uh, this, uh, the, in these avenues, uh, the value is generated uh, as a form of uh, capital by by some sort of attention, as a, as a form of an attention economy. Like when I upload a video, I, I, I would allow people to download it and use it in other ways. They would not be, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the internet was just a, a way to uh, send that to the public, but in YouTube or in other, uh, other uh, uh, platforms like that, you cannot download it, you cannot use the uh, video, you, do, you cannot pro, uh, use this con uh, content, which you generate actually for other purposes. You have to log on and, uh, uh, to that website, you have to be there in order to make use of uh, whatever th this content is. Then, uh, though, uh, in, in the story I tell, uh, my reaction was to, uh, to abandon this place, like uh, not allow uh, the work I do, my, uh, the product of my labor, to be, to, uh, to be a part of this regime. Uh, the same with Rumeniga. Rumeniga was saying that he lost his appetite for scrobbling. He wouldn't scrobble, he wouldn't, uh, he, he will discontinue that activity and he will depart from that private sphere to, uh, to reclaim his, uh, his labor or uh, his, his himself. So Exodus, uh, abandoning these avenues and par of participation, creating and developing co uh, collective spaces which nobody owns is perhaps one way to go. But uh, all these spheres, in, in, uh, in another uh, perspective, all these spheres uh, relies on uh, a control discourse uh, uh, through, uh, which is uh, constituted through certain linguistic, linguistic artifacts which actually sustain such biopolitical regime, uh, if you want to call it that way. Uh, there's a saturation of misinformation and disinformation uh, like this debate I had with this person uh, relieves, like he believes that uh, YouTube uh, provides better video quality. And I mean, in order to get to this debate, you have to know what quality, you, know, you have to know what is codec, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this guy was I informed of this kind of terminology, but in a misinformed way that he, t he thought uh, it was better than the others. So there is this uh, uh, control of information also on the other hand. Uh, another uh, another uh, 
another interesting thing is that when uh, in this kind of debates, we often hear that uh, these platforms actually give people certain tools and uh, cert certain uh, advantages to express themselves. So there is a fair exchange here. Like YouTube gives you the, uh, the tools to upload your video, uh, which otherwise you wouldn't have. And then uh, if there's a profit made out of this uh, business, then it's a fair exchange because they give you something. Whereas uh, most of these tools are uh, already available for free and uh, we have the capacity to develop similar tools if, not, if they are not available already. So there is this uh, confinement of uh, such, uh, such activities, such social by uh, through uh, creating this kind of opinions, diverting uh, public uh, activity as such. Uh, so, and uh, one other thing in that case would uh, reveal uh, misinformation or disinformation uh, as well. At the heart of this disinformation is the freedom of expression, uh, I think, uh, and the participation uh, created as a myth of such government, what I would call governmentality following uh, Kylie. Uh, because we often uh, we are often presented with the idea that this uh, this channel provides us uh, freedom of expression, but at, at this moment we uh, as well know that uh, freedom of expression doesn't mean freedom of information, and uh, I would uh, I would like to quote uh, uh, Gregory, Gregory Bateson uh, in this context. Who, who are saying that information is a difference that makes a difference. It's not something that, that is only in interesting. It is not only something different, which uh, you, can, uh, you can look at YouTube. I guess uh, YouTube presents you some sort of a noise, actually, where uh, there's a multitude of expressions uh, that, uh, that is uh, at your disposal. But uh, are these differences are these multitude of expressions really give us information, really articulate uh, to our existing knowledge to, uh, to create a difference. Uh, do these differences articulate to a differentiation? That, would, uh, that could be, uh, or, or do they stay as a repetition of the mundane, of the banal? Uh, and that would be one other uh, idea to think about, I guess. That is all for, for me. Thank you. Yeah, we have continued on for maybe we have time for uh, additional questions. Anybody? I have one regarding the Hausmann, Hausmannization of the internet. Um, because on one side I understand your argument very well because it's easy to navigate to this address like youtube.com or facebook.com, you know where to go. But I think in itself it's not as um, easy to use as a boulevard in a city as you've got this really non-hierarchical structure. It's not easy to find certain things you might be looking for. And I think it's also an interesting corrective to um, like the media like television or newspapers, so you can also find really um, interesting and it's like it has kind of, um, kind of a corrective, it's like a corrective to also those kind of media. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I thought of it as an analogy in a way, but uh, actually it is not pure noise. That is why it turns into repetition. Because uh, when you log on to YouTube, you see, I guess, I, I don't use it very often, but uh, I, I think there is, uh, you know, top, uh, uh, selections, like there is uh, some content which is given you in the first sight, and there is classifications, there's a taxonomy of uh, what is available, etc. Uh, you can search through certain keywords, etc., etc. And there is a, uh, anyways, there is an organization of this noise. It doesn't come to you as a, Perhaps internet, in the larger sense, is noise itself. But this is uh, this filters. Uh, there's some filters, and in that way, it uh, it guides your movements, like in a boulevard. Uh, you 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 can stroll freely, but there are there are signs which uh, you know attracts your attention and uh, guides you, shows you where to buy what, 
that kind of thing. Uh, anyways, I mean, uh, I thought of Hausmannization as a analogy. Yeah, uh, of course, I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, perhaps it's not a well thought analogy, but uh, I, I was thinking of it, it uh, perhaps as a political analogy, like it, it leads to similar control regimes. Uh, I found it relevant in that way. One is, of course, a physical moment, a physical environment, a, a, a physical urban environment. The, the other is uh, virtual, of course. More questions? Can I ask another question? Uh, it's actually about the same thing, but I, I um, do you want me to? Yeah, I was wondering about the same um, notion of housemanization. But I took it differently than, uh, than Vera Thoman did. Because I thought that um, if, if YouTube is one of the main avenues on the internet, let's say, or of the internet, then where do we look for the underground? Is that sort of, is that offline? No, I think it is there, right? I mean, uh, you can always uh, find, there are also other paths, but the, uh, the, the, the thing is that you are not directed or you are not aware or you are not directed or you do not notice that because, mm -hmm. for example, in this debate I had, uh, the guy was so certain that it is the place to be. That is what, 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 where is, what is the public place. Like uh, there is that, this sense of uh, visibility, mm -hmm. uh, which is of course uh, is a product of uh, information that, they, that is disseminated by the public at large. But I guess it still there exists other parts of the city. Yeah. yeah. And and would you did you suggest him an alternative platform? Like if you would have uploaded to Vimeo, I wouldn't be upset or is there are no, there other places that are, are less uh, uh, I guess uh, at this moment you can find free web hosting. Uh, web hosting does not cost too much. Mm -hmm. And you have uh, free tools to create web pages. You have free tools to uh, to uh, uh, to make streaming video. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if you can navigate through a little bit of information, which would probably take for an uninformed person for two days, perhaps, then you could find uh, the ways to develop your own without YouTube putting your video online. I would, I would uh, argue that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I agree. And I think that the people who took the, the course this morning, the boot camp, all know how and can all teach us now on how to start yeah. <laughs> video platforms or video blogs. But yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank now, I'm ha now I have three microphones. I'll stick to this one, <laughs> <laughs> just in case.